you. And what a doctor chose when he decided between original Medicare and a supplement or Medicare Advantage and why, based on over 30 years of experience in healthcare. This doctor, another doctor, pleads for help. Over 30 years of experience in the medical field, he's asking for your help to get involved. It's an in-depth analysis that I'll cover here for you, as long as we're allowed to keep that video up. And then Aetna's being sued for a data breach. Could you have been involved in that? Over 3 million people are involved. If you were on Medicare Advantage, we'll bring you the latest on that. But first, I want to share you with you um, what I was right about way back in 2018. Many of my internet friends that are also insurance agents, and I see them at insurance conferences across the world, they opined on their YouTube channel some years ago that some people were saying that Medicare Supplement Plan N might have better rate increase experience over the years. And somebody on YouTube is saying that it would. I started saying this in 2018 as an actuarial duh. When MACRA was passed, that would go into effect in 2020. I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, but just to let you know that I was right. Let me prove to you once again, these rate increase announcements came out five minutes ago, and I just doctored them up so you can see the difference in Plan G and Plan N. One of the biggest names and mouths on YouTube right now is saying that they only sell Plan G because Plan G is the best for everybody. That's all their agency sells. They show the numbers out of 10,000 people. They say, well, everybody's got Plan G. Let me share with you why we don't do that, because it's a duh if you take the time to explain to people what's going to happen to them on Plan G. This is the first, I'm not going to show the insurance company's name because this is for agent use only. They just sent it out today. I'm blocking out their name. I'm giving it to you as another example, and I'll show you my website where I've been tracking this since 2018 and been proven right every single year. This is the rate increase differential. Why does this matter? Do you plan on being on Medicare for longer than five years? If you do, you should pay, really pay attention to this. The difference between Plan G and Plan N is way more than just a copay. It is whether or not you can afford to be on a Medicare supplement plan for the rest of your life. I think the longevity of you being on a Medicare plan is important. It's important to me. Even though I make 26% less commission, if I explain to you plan N, which the comments will tell you that other people go into other agencies that are big on YouTube, refuse to talk about plan N. Isn't that shocking? As it pays more commission and it's simpler to explain plan G. I don't want to get off on a tangent. Let me just prove to you how I was right again. These rate increases came out today in the state of New Hampshire with this major, major Medicare supplement insurer. Their rate increase announcement was 10% for plan G going up. 0% for plan N. Isn't that amazing? The state of New Mexico, three and a quarter percent for plan G, which is fantastic compared to what's going on in the rest of the country, I'll tell you. 0% for plan N. Wait a minute. Is this doctored up? No, it's not. Is this unique? No, it's not. I sell from California to Virginia and everywhere in between. We help people with Medicare. I can see the trends and I've been tracking with over 25 insurance companies that we represent across the country. What's going on between Plan G and Plan N? It just makes sense. And I explain it at my website called plannmedicare.org. If your agent was fool enough not to explain Plan N to you, maybe you should take the time and look into Plan N. Just a little reminder, you can get a Plan N Medicare supplement plan 365 days a year. You don't have to wait for October through December. Medicare supplements have nothing to do with this time of year. You can do Medicare supplements, start, stop, change, enroll, drop Medicare supplements any time of the year. So if your agent was foolhardy and just showed you plan G, as many that are doing supplements will, just know that they got 26% on average more commission and did not want to take the time to explain to you that with a very tiny copay, you could be able to afford your Medicare supplement for the rest of your life. Does that make sense to you? Let me show you another example. In the great state of Missouri, 15% rate increase on Plan G, 4% rate increase on Plan N. How does this track over five years? Well, I'm glad you asked. I put this into a calculator and it looked at, let's look at the Missouri rate increase. Let's say that these stayed the same and they do fluctuate a little bit from year to year, but the differential is the same. Plan G, using these numbers that we just got, going up 15% versus Plan N at um going up at, oh, what was the percentage there? Missouri was 15% versus 4%, okay? Here's how that tracks out after five years. 
here's your plan G. I hope you like it. And if we're starting at the average plan G rate across the country of 138, the average standard differential between plan G and plan N is 26%. So plan G started at $130 a month. Plan N started at 26% less. Look at the rate increase. It's 79.4% differential in year five. Do you think you could afford then a $250 a month premium on plan G? Well, the agent who just signed you up because you're plan G and that you're just open enrollment turning 65, that's all he cares about. This is what he wants for you. He wants you to get into a plan G because it's simple. It pays more commission and then get off the phone without explaining that complicated copay situation. And it's not complicated at all. You should see my website where I explain it at planinmedicare.org. This is insane for not explaining this to you, that five years from now, you may not be able to afford your plan G if I just stick you on that plan G. Oh, but it's simple. It pays everything. At what cost? Your affordability? Remember, this is huge to remember. If you cannot change your plan because your health allows you to stay on one plan for the rest of your life, you're screwed. You stay on the same plan. Do you want to be on the G rate going up? Or do you want to be on the end rate going up, assuming something bad may happen to you and you can no longer change plans? I think it's worth explaining the difference and taking the time, just like we explain the difference and take the time to explain Medicare Advantage versus Medicare Supplement. If you don't know that explanation, wait till the end. Here's the, the New Mexico rate going up at a much smaller three and a quarter percent, which is unusually low for Plan G, but even then, Five years out with these same numbers, that's 45% differential. You're paying more. Here is, um, what's the next state ahead? New Hampshire, going up 10%. Five years from now, that's 74% different between plan N. And most of the agents won't even explain the difference to you. It makes me sick. If you're going to be in the industry, agent friends of mine, for longer than five years, you're going to have some very angry customers that ask you, Hey, the guy on YouTube took the time to explain, and I'm not even his client, but he took the time to explain plan N versus plan G. Why didn't you? Why didn't you take the time to explain a plan N to me now that I just got this 15% rate increase that I can't afford anymore? Now I have to give up Medicare supplement and original Medicare and go into a dadgum Medicare Advantage plan because you screwed me over and you never even took the time to explain it. This is literally what's happening in our industry. And yes, I'm going to make even more agents mad at me today. And I don't give a rip. You can't take my birthday away. That's the website that's going to explain the difference and take the time and show example after example after example of why you should consider plan N. If you go to the doctor less than 15 times a year, plan N should be the one that you highly consider. Oh, but those excess charges, that's a bunch of BS. It's called a scare tactic. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. That's what they put in a sales pitch to try to get you on the simple plan that just so happens, just coincidentally, to pay 26% more commission to the agent. We as agents make a percentage of the premium. You don't pay us. The insurance company pays us. So when you work with me, it doesn't cost you a dime. But if you're going to work with somebody who's going to have the honesty, integrity to tell you the full story and then take care of you every year instead of disappear and forget and not even know how underwriting works to get you on a better plan next year, Maybe you should consider who you're doing, doing business with. I'm just saying. Yeah, it gets me fired up because many, many, many seniors are getting screwed over. Just look at the thousands of comments on this channel. And you'll find out. In the news, this is brand new. Hospitals and doctors are fed up with Medicare Advantage. That's exactly the, this is not my headline. This is Kaiser Family Foundation, the nonprofit arm, not the Medicare company, explaining this story. Across the country, Providers grumbling about claim denials and onerous pre-approval requirements by Advantage plans is crescendoing. Didn't know that's a word. Many of my agent friends are putting out on YouTube right now that that Westfall guy is just trying to be the good guy and just citing some anecdotal bullcrap that just doesn't ever happen. Look at the comments, thousands of stories of seniors telling that this thing, same thing is happening. No, it's not just five people testifying in front of the Senate that I brought first on YouTube. No. It's really happening, boys and girls. Little man child out there on YouTube trying to pretend like he's somebody. Some hospitals and physician practices are so fed up, they're refusing to accept the plans. The plans means Medicare Advantage. Even big ones like those offered by beep, 
can't say their word, lifetime ban, and Humana. Quote, the insurance companies running the Medicare Advantage plans are pushing physicians and hospitals to the edge. Chip Kahn, president and CEO of the Federation of American Hospitals, said, it isn't like we've never seen disputes between insurers and providers before, especially in negotiations with employer-sponsored plans, but the focus now on Medicare Advantage seems different said the Associate Director of Senior Policy Attorney for the Center for Medicare Advocacy, who says hospitals and doctors are becoming much more vocal about their frustrations with some of the insurers' cost control efforts. That's called managed care. Who are they managing? You and your care. Baptist Health in Louisville, for example, has threatened that all of its nine hospitals, along with its clinics and physician groups, will cut ties with Advantage plans offered by beep, and well care health plans beginning in January unless they can come to terms. The plans, quote, routinely deny or delay approval or payment for medical care recommended by your physician, the system wrote in a message to patients. The system's medical group with nearly 1,500 physicians and other providers left Humanis Network in September. And in San Diego, which we covered here first, more than 30,000 people are looking for new doctors. We're helping a lot of them. After two large medical groups affiliated with Scripps Health said they would no longer contract with any Medicare Advantage insurers. Which way do you see this trend going? See, I like to see trends from the beginning and help my clients with them rather than see trends at the end and go, oh, crap, somebody on YouTube talked about that five years ago. I'd be the one on YouTube talking about them first because it's, a re it's like a duh, this is going to happen. They're paying hospitals less. They're paying doctors less. What do you think is going to happen when costs are going up for all of them? Revenue is not sufficient to cover the cost of patient care we provide, they said in a statement. They think providers are feeling emboldened by a study by the Health and Human Services Department's Inspector General that I covered in 2018, hmm. and a new one covered in last year that found some Advantage plans have been, what? Denying coverage for care that, should have been provided under Medicare's rules, but the agents will comment, wait a minute, the new rule in 2024 is going to finally say that Medicare Advantage has to play by the same rules. Really? What do attorneys defending seniors all day have to say about this new rule? But I, I don't know that it needs to clarify because it's already, it, it, it's already a rule that Medicare Advantage plans must cover the same as, as must provide at least the same benefits as, as original and, Medicare. And that is exactly my point, that it's not a problem with rules, it's a problem with compliance and enforcement. In other words, the Medicare Advantage plans basically have been flouting their obligations under existing law without a new rule, correct? Absolutely correct, yes. And a new rule is only as good as their being willing to change their real world practices and CMS enforce those obligations, which it has been failing to do, correct? Correct. Huh. So a new rule that CMS is saying, CMS is Medicare saying, finally, you Medicare Advantage plans in 2024, let's do it next year, depending on when you're watching this. They're finally going to have to do the same thing Medicare would do. Wait till you hear the doctor talking about that. That's research the heck out of this. That's coming up in just a minute in his own words. Oh, but wait, since we're talking about doctors and nurses, what did Nurse Hadley say about Medicare Advantage just this week? Another nurse on the same Never topic. Never let a loved one choose a managed care Medicare replacement plan. When you turn 65, you get Medicare. Medicare pays for your doctor's visits, your hospitals, your surgeries, all that stuff. Now, you have the option to choose managed care instead, and then Medicare is going to pay that managed care company a lump sum of what it would normally cost to cover all of this for you. So instead of Medicare paying these services directly, the managed care company is now going to pay them. Now here's the problem. Managed care companies make money by telling you what doctors you can and cannot see. They will deny tests that your doctors say are necessary, and they will kick you out of rehab before your doctor and physical therapist say it's time for you to go home. And now I'm not even exaggerating. Someone in an office somewhere will say, no, you need to go home, even though your doctor and your physical therapist say it's not safe to go home. But if you were on traditional Medicare, that would not happen. I would 
never let a loved one choose a managed care Medicare replacement plan. Oh, that's interesting. That's just a nurse that works in hospice care with seniors all the time. What does she know? What about a doctor? What would a doctor that's been in, in practice for more than 30 years say? Deanna isn't really Medicare. We turn our precious red, white, and blue Medicare card over to the same profiteers that are selling the same inferior insurance product that employers could give workers. We get inferior insurance before retirement because of that, and we get inferior insurance after retirement. Now as Medicare Advantage, so to speak, is taking over. They delay care, they deny care, and they require us to get permission. It's not an advantage unless you're the investor or the CEO. It's Medicare disadvantage for the rest of us. And remember, we're paying them to do this to us. We pay them to take away our choices and to get in the way of our decisions and our health care. Why do we put up with this? We need a mass movement. We need patients and workers and seniors, people with disabilities, students, nurses, doctors, all of us, arm in arm, fighting together to put an end to the profiteering from corporations like Blue Cross and Blue Shield that are destroying health care. Let's get together. Interesting that doctors would have something like that to say, isn't it? In the news, Cigna Medicare Advantage future seems murky among speculations of a sale. And I read the uh, analytics reports on this, and they're thinking that it possibly might be that they're going to divest themselves because the Biden administration Justice Department has been real big on uh, antitrust action against companies trying to be too big. So they might have to get rid of what they already have before they could take over another company. Humana, meanwhile, is in the process of shedding its commercial business to go all in on Medicare, which generated $75.2 billion in revenue for that insurer last year. That would eliminate worries about the effects of a deal with Signal on that market. Many insurers have sought to claim their slice of the Medicare Advantage pie, which now comprises more than half of Medicare beneficiaries. I'll explain to you why that is. That's fascinating. From one of the leaders of CMS Medicare that said why that's happening. You'll be fascinated to hear that. And it continues to grow, but gaining ground on beep and, United, and Humana has been proven challenging. And in many ways, the gold rush in Medicare Advantage is sort of over, said Matt Wolf, financial consulting director in the healthcare practice of the accounting company. Regardless of Cigna's next step, deal making in the health insurance industry is likely in the near future as the sector faces rising costs. Here it goes intensified regulatory scrutiny. What are they talking about? Are people's eyes finally being awakened to what's going on with Medicare Advantage? I wonder how that could be happening. On top of market factors, the federal government is putting more pressure on Medicare Advantage carriers. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is CMS, toughened the standards for the star ratings quality program and risk adjustment data validation process, leading to lower revenue. It's becoming more, much more difficult now to make a buck in this operating environment. So we're going to see more shifts. I bet you we are. And guess who they're going to take that out of? We'll see probably some surprising, mo surprising moves, surprising acquisitions, divestments, new service solution offerings as companies take a real hard look at the business they're in and the businesses that they aren't in. Now, this is an interesting story. This is a doctor with a lot of credibility talking about what he looked at when he was retiring and what he chose. Maybe a fascinating origin to you. As a family physician, this is what he wrote in the Gettysburg Times just this week. As a family physician of 36 years, I had the bountiful experience in dealing with both my patients and my own personal health insurance. As I approached the age for Medicare, I had to make the same decisions as many of my patients as to what type of supplemental insurance I would purchase to accompany my newly earned Medicare coverage. I would like to share my understanding of those options and then opine on my decision. This is fascinating. Quote, I have talked to friends, family, and patients who have told me that they have chosen a Medicare Advantage plan for various reasons, including the lower premiums, the extra perks of dental vision and hearing, and the inclusion of the drug plan benefit. However, buyer beware. I can't draw worth a darn today. The health insurance industry has found a cash cow in its Medicare Advantage plans and therefore has advertised those plans as being the best thing since sliced bread. Oh, it gets better. I rarely, if ever, see traditional Medigap plans advertised because we don't make enough money to do that. This YouTube video, by the way, is coming to you free of charge. This is not an ad. 
People call me all the time. I saw your ad on YouTube. No, you didn't. We don't pay for marketing. We just help people and things happen how they should. Why do you think this might be? For your well-being? Increased profit drives the insurance industry's decision to advertise their Medicare Advantage plans. These companies are paid a fixed amount per enrollee. This amount is adjusted up or down based on the medical risk or complexity of the individual's overall health and their condition that requires care. Because, because these plans are allowed to rest what? restrict our care through prior authorization and limited networks, they reduce their cost and increase their profit margins. When one is denied care, that individual tends to look for other options. This is where it gets good and potentially leaves this insurance plan. When do they leave? When do they leave? Oh, when they're sick. With their departure, the insurance company has one less expensive patient. This is referred to in the industry as lemon dropping. In addition to advertising to a healthier crowd, this cherry picking maximizes the insurance company's profit but does not improve patient care. Wait till the next doctor on video explains this to you in great detail. Don Berwick, a doctor who previously ran CMS. Yes, he ran the agency that runs Medicare, Don did. He stated in an article that he wrote for Journal of Health Affairs, now get this, this is powerful. If an ice cream firm can offer ice cream for free because of a government subsidy, its market share of ice cream eaters will of course grow against firms that charge for ice cream. The cause is not better ice cream, it's free ice cream. His analogy explains the increased popularity of Medicare Advantage plans over Medigap plans, but it's not free. Ultimately, as taxpayers, we are paying for this. There's a more, excuse, there's an insurance agent uh, that goes online now in a much bewildered twangy way and says that, look at the popularity of Medicare Advantage. Everybody's doing Medicare Advantage, so it must be good. That's like saying, look at the propensity of obesity in America and pick up that bag of Doritos, folks, because everybody's doing it. Must be good for you because everybody's doing it. The excessive profit paid to the insurance industry, via this is the doctor still talking, via Medicare Advantage plans, $13.9 that's excess profit. Excess profit. Where do you think that comes from? In 2021 alone, could go a long way toward improving benefits and reducing costs for all Medicare patients. As you make your decision to choose Medigap supplemental insurance or a Medicare Advantage plan to supplement your Medicare Part A and B, it doesn't supplement A and B, it replaces A and B. Look at the Medicare in your guidebook. But anyway, he's not an agent. He doesn't know. Please keep the above information in mind. Dwight Michael, the one that just made this, is himself a retired family physician, a member of the Gettysburg Democracy for America's Healthcare. If you found anything in any of our videos ever in your whole entire life beneficial, please do me a favor and like this video. And if you know somebody who's got a Medicare decision coming up, they don't know which way to go. They don't know who to trust. They don't know which way to turn or they've got something they have to do right now on their Medicare plan. Please give them our information. More than likely, we can help them. Thank you. Thanks for doing that. Thanks for your loyalty. And please share this on your Facebook page if you have one. Now you're going to hear in great detail the rest of the story. This is long. I encourage you to watch it through, its, through, it, through the end. And at the end, I'm going to share with you something fascinating from my friend in New York City that led the New York City, the public service, public sector retirees to a victory over the city of New York City, who wanted to shove all the retirees away from their planned Medicare supplement with original Medicare into a Medicare Advantage plan. And because she reached out with a whole bunch of experts in the industry, and I've known her now for, I think, over a year now, she prevailed. She is tenacious. She continues to to go and research this and bring you what she's found about Medicare Advantage. Her mission now is to help other people, other retirees from other cities and states and large corporations to understand that you don't have to go along with what the retiree program is trying to shove into you. She goes behind the scenes and tells you what the profit is involved. 
what's being paid under the table. And she has the receipts, as they say. She's got the goods. So don't go anywhere until the end of this video while I will show you what she uncovered. And you need to go watch her video and subscribe to her channel. But first, in this doctor's own words, he's going to go over this in depth. Please don't get lost on this. He's going to talk about the difference between original Medicare and Medicare Advantage, what happens on the doctor's side, where the profits are, who's being paid, and which one he would go through with a lot of charts and graphs that make a lot of sense. Yes, he's a doctor. It makes sense. Watch this. It's I'm amazing. a family physician. I'm uh, on the national board. I chair the Missouri chapter. Um, and I spent uh, seven and a half years as, as the chief medical officer of Express Scripts plunging as deeply into the dark side of the force as you can. <laughs> and so um, this is part of my atonement tour, as, as our friend Wendell occasionally would say. So we have a lot to talk about. And for those of you that have seen talks about Medicare or Advantage before, this is a huge issue for all of us. To start, here's something that we all probably have watched happening. We know that Medicare Advantage is now essentially taking over uh, Medicare. The reason I wanted to repeat this data point for you that I know you know um, is because of how legislators interpret this. So when we talk to legislators about our concerns about Medicare Advantage, one of the first things they say is that patients love it. You know, look at how much it's growing. You know, so they say that, you know, they say this specifically, here's a letter from a strong majority of people in Congress, bipartisan, that said older adults on Medicare Advantage report consistent satisfaction with their coverage and quality. Uh, in other words, they, oops, sorry. In other words, they could have said this, the, the market has spoken and Medicare Advantage is growing because it's better and seniors love it. That's honest to Pete, what, uh, what a lot of legislators will, will tell you. Um, not all, but, but a lot. Um, and I think, you know, one of my heroes is, is Don Berwick. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Um, you know, he's a huge former administrator of CMS, and he made a pretty good comment, I thought, about why Medicare Advantage is so, is so popular. He said, if an ice cream firm can offer ice cream for free because of a subsidy, its market share will, of course, grow against firms that charge for ice cream. It's not because of it's better ice cream, it's because it's free ice cream. <laughs> and that's, of course, what we need to bear in mind. Medicare Advantage isn't growing because it's better, and I'll show you some information about that. It's because of the incredible subsidies that we're, in my mind, wasting our time on. And as you know, we're also wasting our money. So, you know, here's the overhead of traditional Medicare, depending on what year and what exact way you look at it. It hovers around 2%. And, and you have to add in profits if you want to look at the commercial insurance industry, of course, and with them, uh, it comes up to a much, much, much higher number, which is money, of course, that's not spent on, on actual health care. What about clinical outcomes? Uh, we saw one study that Adam uh, presented this morning, um, and that's about it that I know of for suggestions of, of quality outcomes. For the most part, there really isn't any uh, solid research comparing clinical outcomes. So we know we're spending more. And there's not much outcomes data. And the reason for that is because Medicare Advantage so infrequently releases any meaningful outcomes data. Medicare doesn't have the ability, I guess, to compel that. Uh, and so we see Medicare Advantage or MedPAC reports over and over again saying, we don't have the data. We can't actually give this analysis to you. So let's spend a moment uh, sort of defining what Medicare Advantage is, uh, just so we're all on the same page. Here's traditional Medicare, as you know. It's it's uh, simple and efficient uh, and operates, as we said, with about a 2% overhead. And it's almost as simple uh, as this cartoon, although you know we know that there's some pieces of it that aren't really that simple. So that's that traditional Medicare, essentially. Medicare Advantage, as I think saw, we saw a little bit in the slide uh, this morning from Dan, uh, is, is almost the same, except that it's completely different. Instead, we impose insurance companies in between Medicare, we still pay our taxes, Medicare, you know, and that still happens. And then, Medi then Medicare Advantage introduces these uh, commercial insurance products. So Medicare has to have a contract with each one of them. There's complexity and expense in that. And then each one of them has to have a contract with medical groups, doctors and pharmacists, you know, and, and hospitals. And, and not, I guess not pharmacists so much, but all over the place. Um, and it's even more complicated than that because it's not, you can go to anybody, it's we like this doctor, we don't like that doctor. So this huge complexity, huge complexity, and of course there's gaps uh, um, in there. So Medicare Advantage is 
fundamentally complicated. There is no real guardrail you can put around it. There is no way you can really improve it to be anything near what we want from uh, traditional Medicare or from um, uh, Medicare uh, for all. So Medicare Advantage, unlike traditional Medicare, Medicare Advantage makes heavy use of the tools of managed care. Um, so, you know, we as we're going to come to at the end, messaging to physicians, when physicians are are distraught, as we all are, when we have to deal with prior authorizations and step therapy, and we experience that through our Medicare patients, it's incumbent on us to make sure that they understand that that's their Medicare Advantage patients, and to point out, and they may not always see it, depending on how their office is set up, that it's Medicare Advantage that does those things. It's not uh, traditional Medicare. Um, and it's, you know, a Medicare Advantage, as we know, has these crazy networks, as I kind of cartooned you. Never, traditional Medicare doesn't do that hardly at all. 89% of adult medicine physicians accept traditional Medicare, 96% of surgeons accept traditional Medicare as a payment model, according to a June 2022 uh, survey. So no, no, no commercial insurance company offers a network like that. And as we know, and I'm not going to be labor, the business model that Medicare Advantage, like other commercial insurance products, is to you know essentially avoid sick people and try to attract uh, the healthy. High overhead, we you know we talked about a moment, and I'm not going to unpack most of that in any detail because we there's lots of other places where we've done that, um, including today a bit. But I am going to unpack this a bit more. Uh, the accusations of fraud uh, that that are so rampant uh, in the Medicare Advantage um, companies. So. Um, we saw this get above the fold recently when the New York Times, uh, there was a huge article uh, on Sunday a few weeks ago. You should know that PNHP had a large voice in getting that uh, in getting that to, to happen, uh, actually. So just lightning round through it. Um, all the time uh, we see we see accusations of fraud. Here's an OIG audit. And I'm pointing this out to say this isn't, you know, some fly by night group auditing it. This is the Office of the Inspector General auditing Humana in Florida and found that they were being overcharged by nearly $200 million through up upcoding and such. And indeed, the recommendation to repay, according to according to OIG, this would be by far the largest audit, audit penalty ever imposed. And notice it's not yet resolved, even though it was audited then. Sutter settled uh, for $90 million for knowingly submitting fraudulent diagnoses. And they're kind of striking if you look at these at the, what this audit showed. It said the diagnoses of fractures, 66% of the times that M8 plans said there were fractured, fractures, fractures, <laughs> that, that that was fraudulent. I imagine sometimes it was completely fabricated. Most of the time it was, you know, well, he broke his wrist when he was 16 and now he's 70. So that's still a medical problem. And we need to upcode, we need to include that code. 90% of the cancer diagnosis, 90% of the cancer diagnoses, according to this audit, uh, were, were, uh, were like that. And, and even more for strokes. Again, most of them were kind of remote um, events. Uh, so, if this one gets settled, it will be, oh no, it was settled, I'm sorry, when this one was settled, it was the largest false claim act ever settled. Now, the reason I'm bringing this one up is because it's sort of a typical example, of the fact that it was settled, right? It was settled. So that means that Sutter never admitted, perhaps they were really not guilty, but they were never really admitted or convicted of fraud. Turns out to be important that they settled and were never actually um, convicted. Um, so there's lots of these, you know, we, we saw uh, this morning, I think Daniel uh, showed the slide of this, which I'm going to kind of just make a little prettier, but the same data. Um, many of them uh, have been accused of fraud. My point to bringing it back to you is that these accusations of fraud are, again, from really credible sources. So here it's being accused of being a fraud by a whistleblower. And what is it, six of them, uh, five of them that, uh, these, of these top 10, accusations of fraud by the United States government, even more have been accused of fraud by the United States government, not by, you know, Bobby in, in St. Louis, but by the, by the fraud by the United States government and, and overbilled according to the U.S. Attorney uh, Inspector General. So this is, a, this is a big deal. But my point of this little revisiting of this question is that accusations, uh, settlements, penalties, and fines are not as potent as would be convictions. And convictions can justify excluding you, convictions for fraud by, can justify excluding you from the MA, from, from any federal program, uh, Medicare or Medicaid. And hence, we're always seeing this, they settled for $90 million, but there's no admission of guilt. 
So I don't think that's a coincidence. So uh, make sure we're all on the same page about risk scores, and we're not going to do kind of the deep dive into the numbers uh, on risk scores as we've done, as, as I've done in the past, and as we saw a little bit from Daniel this morning, but just a little bit so we understand how this even exists and why it's such an easily gamed problem. What are these risk scores? The risk score is what determines how, how much the Medicare Advantage plan is paid per person. So if you have a higher risk score, uh, then the Medicare Advantage plan is paid more for you. And if you're like zero risk scores, then they're paid, they're paid less. And the risk scores uh, are also are technically called the hierarchical condition category. Technical phrases, the hierarchical condition category. And we're not going to unpack that more, if, but we could if you want. So HCAs uh, or HCCs, those are the same things when we say risk scores. Uh, and they're based on a variety of things, but one of those is diagnosis codes. And that's really important. When you think about how, uh, how diagnosis codes are established and how things are paid for. So in, in, in traditional Medicare, Medicare, physicians are paid by we're all physicians are largely, um, or we're, we're paid by CPT codes, by procedural codes, right? The 99215s or what have you. So we're paid by procedure codes, not by diagnosis codes generally. So we make sure that we have enough whatever to document to get up to the highest procedure code. And we don't, you know, in the traditional Medicare, there's no financial incentive to do, uh, to capture useless, needless, irrelevant, off-topic uh, diagnostic codes. But but Medicare Advantage is paid the opposite. They're not paid by CPTs, they're paid by ICD-10s. So they have a game to, to maximize the number of ICD-10s uh, that, that they can reimburse. And we saw from Daniel this morning, uh, sort of a dollar amount of what that upcoding uh, looks like. The point of this is that they've gotten really good at that since that's where the money is. Uh, the, the ratio of, IC, of, of, of coding intensity versus demographic analysis has been skyrocketing in Medicare Advantage. Uh, and that's not because people in Medicare Advantage have been getting sicker. Um, indeed, there is really no difference in the health status from over this time period. So the, the diagnostic codes are getting more intense, but the patients are not getting sicker. Uh, and in fact, uh, these unsupported diagnoses are a major part of the, of the um, overpayments in Medicare uh, Advantage. And now we see that the numbers are still, still skyrocketing up, not, not going down. Um, you would say, well, Medicare Advantage is paying for itself, right? Because it's saving all this money. The Kaiser family recently said, once again, their Medicare Advantage has never, never generated savings relative to traditional Medicare. And in fact, they don't generate savings. The opposite is true. And that's indeed what these bar charts show you is every year since at least 2008 in this data point, um, they you know they 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 have not been making savings. they've been they've been getting getting more. And as we saw from Daniel, it dwarfs budgets. Medicare Advantage overbilling, and that's just one piece of how they get more money. Medicare Advantage overbilling uh, dwarfs all of these, uh, all of these. So, you know, where do we want to spend our money? Not, not there, if you ask me. They create their, um, so Medicare has coverage rules, all right? If you're in traditional Medicare, there are rules about what's covered, what's not covered. There are rules about what's paid and what's not paid. And I think of this a little bit like national cancer guidelines, where there are broad guidelines. But any individual plan can narrow it. So you can drive a truck through cancer guidelines. You know, there's a lot of space in there. There's a lot of space in Medicare, traditional Medicare coverage rules too. And Medicare Advantage plans are allowed to create their own proprietary guidelines. I think of them as double secret guidelines. <laughs> you can't get them. You know, they, they don't typically share them. They don't post them. But they're allowed to create their own proprietary coverage rules. Um, and as a consequence of that, uh, denials of prior authorization requests by Medicare Advantage plans, denials of prior authorization requests by Medicare Advantage plans that met Medicare coverage rules, 13% of their denials actually met Medicare Advantage coverage rules. And denials of payments was actually as high as 18%. Um, so, so these plans are able to create and protect privately their own secret coverage rules that are not contained in the Medicare uh, coverage rules. And that's part of why you run into all these speed bumps in Medicare Advantage that we don't usually run into um, in, in traditional Medicare. 
And this really hurts our patients, as we, as we know. So the percentage with cost-related uh, problems accessing care in traditional Medicare, it's not zero, it's real, but it's much higher in traditional in Medicare Advantage. Uh, good news for the white folks here, it's, uh, it's, it's less if you're white. <laughs> uh, if you're Hispanic, it's worse. And if you're, uh, if you're Black, it's horrible. So if you look at these numbers, traditional Medicare folks with Medigap, Black folks with, with, with Medicare, Medicare and Medigap, 20% of them have trouble accessing care, whereas um, white folks who are in Medicare Advantage have a lower number. So, the, I mean, the, the racial disparities here are just one of a gazillion uh, examples we could we could have, um, and these numbers are even more striking uh, for people who are in who are in poor health. If you select uh, for that, people who are in Medicare Advantage because of their coverage rules don't go to the premier hospitals as, as often. This is really important. You know, if you've had cancer in your, when you have cancer in your patients, you know, you try to send them to the place that you kind of think that they should go to. But when it's in your family, there's like no room for negotiating. You know, when somebody in your family gets something, you want to do your own searching. You want to figure out where you want them to go and you want to go to the best place that there is. And if you have, if you have Medicare Advantage, you're not as likely to be able to do that. And it's not for everything. For an appendectomy, probably, you know, surgeons at every most hospitals can probably do that well. But if you need some of these procedures, you know, you don't want to have someone else tell you that you can't go to those places. So, so significantly fewer procedures. And I'm particularly dismayed by the number on the Whipple procedure. You know, when I was in med school, we were taught, try not to do that procedure. It's too, it's too dangerous. So you really want to go to somebody who has experience uh, with it. And so as a consequence of this, people, well, when they're, when they're really sick, they try to leave Medicare. And so before the final year of life, uh, less than 2% of people uh, try a, a switch back from Medicare Advantage and traditional Medicare. And during the final year of life, people are, are more inclined um, to do that. Um, and the reason is because they, they, they have difficulty accessing the specialized care that we know they need, that they know, that they know they need. Um, so I don't know if you have met uh, our PNHP board member, Jessica uh, uh, Shore-Sachs, but she had a terrific a terrific column uh, in the in the Charlotte Observer, I think it is, uh, recently about a, about a month ago or so, and she said, "So if it's so bad, why are people picking Medicare Advantage?" And we're going to try to unpack that quite a bit more because I think we need we all need to understand that. She said, "Despite all these problems, despite all these problems," uh, Dr. Sachs said, "the low premiums in perks may still be attractive to seniors who are not yet not yet uh, sick." But the situation often changes when they develop uh, an illness, as we were as we were starting to see. So, what I'd like to do is, for a moment is unpack the difference between traditional Medicare and Medicare Advantage. I'm not sure that that some of our key groups, legislators and patients, particularly understand it. So, so traditional Medicare, 40% um, of them have picked traditional Medicare uh, because they wanted that choice of doctors and hospitals. 40% of people in traditional Medicare picked it for that reason. 24% of people in Medicare Advantage picked Medicare Advantage because they wanted more benefits. Uh, and they want they like that idea of an out of pocket limit, um, so they, they're making the choice for that. Nine percent of Medicare uh, traditional Medicare people picked it because they were recommended to go into traditional Medicare by trusted people, and I think that's what happened with my sister in law about a month ago. I guided her into into traditional Medicare uh, for for that for that kind of reason. But f interestingly, fifteen percent of people, more people, picked Medicare Advantage because they've been guided into it by trusted people. Some people are in traditional Medicare because they kind of had to be in there. They've got this this these sort of you know resources. Um, and eleven percent, uh, likewise, in an employer. A tiny percentage understand the financial impact of, of traditional Medicare versus Medicare Advantage, and they pick Medi traditional Medicare for that reason, and, and a few people pick Medicare Advantage for the other. But the thing I'd like to point out to you is some are picking Medicare Advantage because we're recommending it. We physicians are recommending it uh, to our people, to our patients. So we know traditional Medicare is imperfect. You know, as you know, in traditional Medicare, uh, there's a 20% co-insurance, and I know you know what co-insurance um, is. There's a 2023, the hospital deductible uh, is going up from 1550 or so to 1600. 
um, and there's still no out-of-pocket limits. So these prices can become uh, pretty unaffordable. And then you've got to deal with premiums for Part B, of course, Part D, and uh, and you probably would want to try to buy a Medigap plan. And we're going to talk about that in some excruciating detail in a moment. Not excruciating. You'll like that. It'll be fun. Um, so they have three options. You can stay in traditional Medicare and not go into Medigap. And if you do that, as I just alluded to, you're exposed to bankruptcy. The out-of-pocket costs have no limit. So if you don't get a Medigap plan and you're in traditional Medicare, and about 10% of people, I think, in uh, in Medicare are in this situation, um, you, you can instead choose to get out of traditional Medicare and go into Medicare Advantage, uh, as we've been unpacking, or you can stay in traditional Medicare and purchase Medigap. But there are some really important things about Medigap that that are not widely understood and that's one of the reasons i'm so was so eager to talk about this whole topic um, with you you might be able to go into medigap so what does that mean uh well, let's compare medicare part g or a medigap plan and i'm using part g or plan g as an example um because that's really the most sensible choice these days. Plan F was better, but but you can't join that anymore. It's closed to new enrollments. So let's look at Medigap Plan G versus Medicare Advantage. There's a premium uh, to, to purchase a Medigap uh, policy, and I think the average is around two hundred dollars a month. Um, then there's, uh, but if you do that, then there is nothing out of pocket after you've gotten into uh gotten past the fairly modest uh, deductible 226 dollars deductible um in 2023 so you pay a premium but then there's no out-of-pocket expense as long as you stay within traditional medicare which is almost almost everywhere medigap policies do not expand the benefit design so medigap policies plan g for example does not include dentistry or optometry or hearing aids it's just fixing the co-pays uh, and deductibles. Uh, but the Medigap, Medigap also has no impact on the network. So if you're in traditional Medicare and you do the smart thing and buy a supplemental policy, if you can afford one, um, if you do that then, or you get it through, through being through another source, if you do that, then you still have the full traditional Medicare um, network. Um, and you don't get exposed to all the utilization management shenanigans that happen um, in, in Medicare Advantage. So Medigap plans do not add utilize step therapy or prior authorization. That doesn't, doesn't do that. Just deals with the co-pays and deductibles. Medicare Advantage, on the other hand, I mean, I think 69% is the number I saw. 69% of people in Medicare Advantage pay no premium. Uh, I could have done that when I retired. They pay no premium to be in Medicare Advantage. Uh, the people who do pay a premium, the other 31%, the premium average is around $56 for them um, uh, this year. Um, so, But the average, if you look at all the comers, in Medicare Advantage, the average is an $18 premium per month compared to around $200 uh, for, for, um, for um, a Plan G. Um, there is an out-of-pocket network with uh, a limit um, which uh, can be varied somewhat by plan. And please understand that plan G is not $200 a month, unless you've been on it for a long time or you're in New York or Florida or somewhere where the rates are crazy. Uh, he also doesn't know about plan N, so he's not an insurance expert. You just tell him the backstory of how these things basically work. That rate is um, just a little bit crazy. And if that's the rate that he's got, he needs a better agent. But anyway. But the combined network, the combined out-of-pocket network, out-of-pocket expense for people um, using in-network and out-of-network is is more than twelve thousand dollars. So yes, there's a limit, but not a not a terribly good limit, uh, and it's smaller if you stay um, in-network. And some plans have lower out-of-pocket limits. Um, as we know, Medicare Advantage can add in extra perks, extra things, um, but they have you know the whole network issue becomes becomes a point. And Medicare Advantage, as I've said twice now, and I'll say it probably once more, uh, introduces all of the utilization management things that we're that we all uh, are so distraught over uh, in commercial um, insurance. So those things exist in Medicare Advantage. They're they're really common in Medicare Advantage, and they're they're virtually non-existent uh, in traditional Medicare. But the reason people make this decision, typically, as I showed you, is because it's almost free. Most people in this situation have maybe heard some of the stuff that we just said about networks and prior authorizations and, and all of that stuff, but they're looking at 
$200 versus $18. And so what they think they'll do, and here's the flaw that I really want to make sure we all understand, what they think they'll do is, you know, you know, I'm healthy. I'm going to be healthy for a while. You know, I don't care. You know, when I'll I'll save the money, and when I get and I'll go into Medicare Advantage, I'll pay them their much more modest premium. And if I get sick and I'm unhappy about it, you know, I can always switch back. I can always switch back to traditional Medicare, and that's all over the Medicare Advantage materials. If you want to get out of Medicare Advantage, you can do that whenever you want. Not to not to worry. But what they don't tell you is that you would be getting out and may or may not be able to buy a Medigap policy because there's a trap that most people making this decision don't know. And so they don't know the trade-off that they're making. So the Affordable Care Act introduced two really important uh, we, we all know the pros and cons of the ACA, and I'm not here to relitigate that question, but there are two really important protections to commercial insurance that, that we now take for granted, but that people don't realize are not in Medicare. Those, those protections, those consumer protections, those patient, patient protections are not in, the ACA did not extend them to Medigap. So the key, the first one is it's called guaranteed issue. So um, this means that for the for the first six months, federal law is that for the first six months that you're in Medicare Part B, um, any Medigap plan that you apply to is guaranteed to sell you a policy. So if you're for the first six months that you're in Medicare Part B, a Medicare Gap insurance company must sell you a policy. Uh, if you ask for it, they can't send you the health survey questionnaires. They can't say, oh, you've got the cancer. We're not letting you in. They have to let you in. Uh, and um, and that disappears after six months. After six months in Medicare Part B, suddenly the insurance companies, when you apply for one, are absolutely allowed to send you health survey questionnaires and decide whether you're too sick or healthy to sell you a policy. That six-month period is extended to 12 months. Guaranteed issue goes to 12 months as a trial period for you if you go into Medicare Advantage. So once you're in Medicare Advantage for 12 months and a day, if then you get something where you want a disease, where you wanna go out of network, or you wanna whatever, you're tired of, you, you wanted to step therapy or some prior authorization that's that's not giving you what you, that what you need, at 12 months and a day, you decide you wanna get out of Medicare Advantage and go back to traditional Medicare, you can do that but you might find that you can't buy a Medigap policy and therefore your exposure to, to bankruptcy for leaving that is become, becomes outrageous. Medigap policies, it turns out, are regulated at the state level. So if you're looking for something, what can our chapter organize around? This might be one of them. I mean, it's, I don't know that this is the right one to pick, but, but it's one of the things that, you can, that, that can be regulated by states. And in fact, four states have uh, guaranteed issues. So uh, meaning anybody uh, can get Medigap anytime that they that they that they apply. They don't have to the six to 12 month period uh, disappears. So Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, and uh, and with a little more uh, caveats on it, uh, the state of Maine. So states can do this. I believe these states did this a long, long time ago. I don't believe a state has actually made this change in the last many years. Ron Wyden, Senator Wyden's uh, health care uh, uh, or Senate Committee on Healthcare fin on Finance released this massive new report, uh, which I'd recommend you, you look at if you haven't seen it. Have you seen this report? I have not done a deep dive into it, but I found some things I thought were kind of interesting and fun that I thought I'd show you. I've never seen this before. Uh, so the, the report documents tons of uh, fraudulent marketing and advertising. Uh, and here's sort of one fun little example. There's a Medicare bus, <laughs> medicarebus.com. So it drives around, I guess, and uh, it exists today. And I, uh, I, uh, I saw this last night and, uh, and I went to medicarebus.com and it takes you to a commercial insurance broker. It doesn't take you to, doesn't take you to Medicare. Um, more, you know, little, maybe less amusing. I found that pretty, I just find, that's my sense of humor. I found that funny. Perhaps a little bit less amusing is uh, the, this report from Senator Wyden uh, shows uh, this. Uh, that some of the some of the um, Medicare Advantage uh, companies are sending out these mailers that that look like their their federal tax documents. I mean, you know, that looks like a federal tax document. So it gets your attention, and and this is actually uh, working. It turns out seniors are starting to notice this. Seniors are starting to notice 
these misleading ads, the Joe Namath ads, which have been changed a little bit, but they're the Joe Namath ads and all these other things. Uh, seniors are noticing this more than they ever have and complaints to Medicare, to CMS about misleading or plain false advertising uh, has been going up quite a bit in the last two years. Uh, and that's in part because these ads and marketing materials have gotten way worse in the last few years. The Trump administration undid uh, some of the regulations on this and some of the supervisions on this. So the ads, as bad as they were 10 years ago and five years ago, the last few years are even more egregious. I see this as an opportunity for us. I see Trump's dismantle, President Trump's having dismantled some of the protections um, as, as limited as you know, we all have, have our concerns about Medicare Advantage, I'm right there. Um, but, but, but now it's becoming obvious to people, and I see that as an opportunity. The primary source of these complaints are from the things you would think, from um, mail advertisement, from television advertising, from the telemarketers. Some robocalls will call you uh, in the report. They said there are some robocalls coming in one robocaller making 20 calls per day to pay to to prospective members i mean it's you know we can't use our phones anymore you know that was probably medicare advantage calling me <laughs> my phone went off a moment ago um so how, how is this happening um it's, it's happening in part because that's where the money that's we told you how that's where the money is but a lot of people turn to an insurance broker for guidance about what to do hey i'm 65 now what do i do about my medicare do i get you know do i do i do one of these you know what do i do what do i do and i didn't this well this is new information actually that medicare advantage pays a when a broker enrolls you in medicare advantage they get a pretty dramatic um commission they get a pretty dramatic commission. And their commission for enrolling you in Medigap is smaller and getting smaller. So that the brokers are very conflicted on this. There, there's this conflict here. And understand, once they get you in, once a broker signs you up for Medicare Advantage, if you don't change brokers, or if you don't change Medicare Advantage plans, the broker gets that commission every year for 10 years. The commission gets a bit smaller in the out years. It's about half the size of the initial commission, but they, they keep getting, it's the gift that keeps giving. So there's a lot of money in it for uh, for these brokers. And CMS actually did a secret shopper process on looking at what insurance agents uh, say. And it turns out according to CMS's secret shopper call, 80%, 80%, you know, when you see those numbers in medicine, I mean, I translate that to 100%, you know, but 80% of calls were inaccurate or insufficient in what they led. So one example, I thought this was sort of struck home with me. If your medication is not on formulary, just tell your doctor. The doctor will tell the plan and the plan will just put it on the formulary. I'm not making this up and this isn't from, you know, a fringe, or, this is from CMS. This is a CMS secret shopper uh, type type thing. I want to uh, propose three key messages. So the first thing is that most patients don't understand that that $200 trade-off against the $18 trade-off, they don't understand all of the rest of the financial implications of that decision. And now not everybody can obviously afford uh, to buy a, Medi a Medigap plan. And that's why we see so much Medigap, Medicare Advantage penetration among certain populations. But if you can afford it, you know, the, they need to at least understand, people need to at least understand the decision that they're making. Um, they need to understand that they're not just kind of, you know, huh? You know, when you hear something crazy, kind of going, what? And scratch your head. No, there's compelling evidence from Medicare that many of the promotions are deceptive, fraud, and predatory. So why doesn't Medicare fix that? Um, why, why do they let this go on? Well, actually, there has been significant progress uh, over the last two years under the Biden administration on some on some of this. You know, it's still Medicare Advantage with all the fundamental flaws that can't be fixed, but, but there's that. And the thing that seniors really need to understand, that our patients really need to understand, is this issue of you may not be able to buy a Medigap policy if you've been 12 months in Medicare Advantage. I promise you 95% of people making that decision have no idea about this fact.
So if there's one thing you wanted to tell people when they're thinking, hey, doc, should I do a Medigap or should I do Medicare Advantage? That would be the one thing that I would really, really focus on. And when you're talking to physicians, I just I hope this isn't insulting, but they need to understand that Medicare Advantage is not traditional Medicare. And most doctors that I talk to bemoan these things with us. You know, they bemoan these problems with us. I'm not telling them any news that Medicare Advantage gets in the way of patient care. They know this. But what they don't realize how is how incredibly potent their voice is. How incredibly potent their voice is. Talk to their patients. You know, try to go to grand rounds and try to be able to talk about it there. You know, write those op-eds. You know, um, uh, Jessica uh, Zach said that, you know, her op-ed drew in a lot of new people who hadn't thought it through. Um, George Bompok, you know, uh, lots of examples of people hearing this from their colleagues and going, well, and then it getting through. So if they get this, they need to raise their voice because really we are the only ones in the position to be seeing upfront and personal how this interferes directly with patient care and not just in the way of, well, I didn't like that, but in the way of, no, this is really dangerous. This is what's happening. So we need to raise our collective voices. And if, if a doc says, yeah, I'm with you, ask, ask that doc to, you know, to raise their voice. And lastly, my point would be to, to legislators, um, use that free ice cream metaphor, you know, it's, you know, because they will come back with you and say, hey, you know, shut up, doc, you know, it's, it's so popular, it's growing by leaps and bounds, and use Don Berwick's, you know, quote him, you know, mention his name, because, you know, most legislators, since he was head of CMS for a while, know his name and respect him, and he wrote this, it's in public, there's a reference on the bottom of the slides that you'll get, he published this, that no, 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 it's not because Medicare Advantage is better, it's free ice cream, everybody wants the free ice cream, you know, why not? Um, so second message, I think, is to make sure that they, to dispense that myth that Medicare Advantage is saving the country money. Dispense that myth. Ask them, why do you think that? A legislator says, well, you know, it's cheaper. Why do you think that? Help us understand that because there is no database for that. And uh, and then lastly, what's really been resonating the last uh, the last few weeks in in probably more and more is the idea that it's um it it's it's fraud you know it's fraud you know fraud it may not be the entire business model of medicare advantage but it's really a common thing you know it's a really common thing it's hard to make as much money off of medicare advantage as they want to if they don't do these fraudulent uh, behaviors um so the very last piece i want to discuss is sort of you know how do we a bit, a bit more about how do we get there and i'd say you know of course we want to get the bills passed, you know, we want we want the bill in the House and the Senate passed, you know, get your legislators to co-sponsor this. Of course, we want that. That's the core core goal. But as Scarlett, are you driving? Yeah, yeah baby, are you driving? So there's little Scarlett in her brand new car at the age of nine months old. But anyway, that doctor had a lot to say. And it's in his own words as to how it's actually affecting patients, hospitals, the taxpayers, the government, the doctors, and the rest. Oh my goodness. And he talked specifically about Medicare trial right, that after the first year in a Medicare Advantage plan, you cannot get back to a Medicare supplement without going through underwriting. Now, underwriting is not impossible. We can help with that process. And if you're on a Medicare Advantage plan and you have the time ahead of you of January 1st through March 31st, listen carefully, January 1st through March 31st, that's when you can go through the Medicare Advantage open enrollment period that they call that. And you could apply through underwriting for a Medigap policy, Medicare supplement, and then you can make that transition. That does not have to happen before December 7th. It can happen January 1st through March 31st. The best thing you can possibly do is not call an, an 800 number like our 800 number, Go to the website. If you go to the website, you can actually book an appointment. You can actually do the permission slip required by Medicare before we can discuss Medicare plans. That permission slip is required before we can discuss all of your options available in Medicare. You can do all that. Book an appointment, sign the form, get ready, know what's going on, find out what's happening with you by going to the website, not by leaving a message. Thousands of people have now left a message with us and our people are just working appointments because that's all they have the time to do. We could have hired 300 more agents, and then we probably would have kept up with everybody calling in and expecting that we're just sitting there waiting for the phone to ring. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Our YouTube channel has exploded. So all year long, 
you could get a Medicare supplement plan if you don't have one. If you're on Medicare Advantage, a little bit more tricky. I'll talk about that in a second. But if you want to change your Medicare supplement, the best time to do that is not during the annual election period for Medicare. When it's all over the TV, it's all over everywhere. Best time to change your Medicare supplement, to shop it, to redo it, because those rates do go up. And it takes an agent who knows how to get underwriting done, like our office does, to get you in a better plan, a better company with maybe the same plan. We can do that all year long. It does not have to happen now. And then at the end of December 7th, you can no longer sign up for a brand new Medicare Advantage plan if you never did have one. That deadline is December 7th if you never had an Advantage plan and you want to sign up for one. But from January 1st to March 31st, as covered right here, January 1st to March 31st, you can change your Medicare Advantage plan or drop it. It has been such an exhausting season. I'm telling you what, exhausting. Just to make sure you're aware, you could go with original Medicare, which most agents don't share with you that that's an option, but you could. You could go to original Medicare, which is what you've earned and paid into your whole life. It means no networks, no restrictions, no prior authorization. Nobody can tell you what you can have done and what you cannot have done. If your doctor says you can have it done and it's medically necessary and it's covered by Medicare, which is most everything that's medically necessary, it's just done. The only problem with original Medicare is it doesn't cover 20% of the Part B cost, which is the outpatient cost. That's why the people like to get what this doctor just talked about, a Medigap policy, so you don't go bankrupt with unlimited costs. Put those two things together and you are fully protected to go to any provider that accepts Medicare from coast to coast in the country. You can move states, you can travel, you can go anywhere you want to. And you have doctors and hospitals you can see without restrictions. On the other hand, you leave original Medicare, you go to Medicare Advantage, you play by their rules. The HMOs have a network, the PPOs have a network, and you can go out of the network if the doctor out of the network says, yes, I'll bill your plan on your behalf and accept their rates. Good luck with that. And your costs are a lot higher with cost share, but at least you have an option on a PPO plan to go out of the network, maybe. With a Medicare Advantage plan, you really should check into a cancer plan. You really should have cancer coverage if you're on Medicare Advantage because it doesn't cover all of your cancer treatment costs. It just doesn't, not at all. You should have a cancer plan that covers two times your annual maximum out of pocket, two of them times. So if your max out of pocket is $8,000, you should at least have a cancer plan with $16,000 worth of coverage. That may run you $30 or $40 a month. You'd be smart to have it. And then a hospital indemnity plan is one that can pay for your major costs that Medicare Advantage has, typically go into the hospital, ambulance charges, things like that. Both of those things are available through our office, and you don't have to get them before December 7th. You can get those policies any time of the year. The cancer plans and hospital indemnity, neither one of these are available in the state of California because their laws prohibit it. Why, I don't know. If you're before 65, you can get them. If you're after 65, they're banned there. So pretty valuable coverage. You should have it and look into it. You can look at our website called cancerplan.us and you can see about the cancer plan coverage. Here are some of our helpful websites. If you need to get a Part D plan, you can go to startpartd.com 24 hours a day. It's a Medicare approved site. It's not a Medicare site. It's a Medicare approved site, which means we don't have all the plans. We just have the plans that we contracted with after our scrutiny of the plans. You can sign up with those plans there. You can see all the costs. Just sign up with a plan that has the lowest estimated total out-of-pocket costs for the year. And by default, that's how the site is set up. That's what it's going to show you first. Medicare Advantage near me, if you want to sign up for a Medicare Advantage plan, you have to do that either when you're brand new to Medicare or before December 7th, if you don't already have one. If you do have a Medicare Advantage plan and you want to change it and look at what else is in the market, you can continue to do that from January 1st to March 31st, MedicareAdvantageNearMe.com. Then if you want to see what's involved in underwriting, if you want to go from Medicare Advantage to a Medicare supplement plan, and you're not in your open enrollment period, you can see how the underwriting works right here. I've got a video. I'll go over actual questions. I'll show you how the process works. If you just want to see how do I go from Medicare Advantage to Medicare supplement, don't just drop your Medicare Advantage plan. Had another person say in the comments that they just did that yesterday. Don't just drop your Medicare Advantage plan please come to our website at SeniorSavingsNetwork.org and I walk through the process. Just click on the Medicare help, go to Medicare Advantage to supplement. That's what you want to do. And then the video explains how to do it. 
and you can see if you can qualify to do it or not. And you can do that from October 15th through December 7th. And again, from January 1st through March 31st, December 7th is not your deadline to drop a Medicare Advantage plan. We've probably got 800 people on our voicemail list that just called in and left a message and want us to call them back. And we will. But when? Because the people who go to the website have already filled our calendar with appointments. So we'll continue to try to call you back all year long as best we can. But go to the website. It's the best place to go. And then if you're on Medicare due to disability under the age of 65, this explains in great detail what your options are and how we may be able to help you. Uh, let's see. This is a new comment that came in. Let's see if I can actually read it. Can I get there? Yes. Let me tell you about the difference between original Medicare and the scam of Advantage plan, he said. She said, Justina. Medicare is protected in more ways than one. Example, Aetna Medicare Advantage plan was hacked by a Russian ransom where a group called CLOP. Aetna did not pay the ransom and allowed 3 million people to lose their identity and all of their HIPAA rights were violated when Aetna didn't pay the ransom. CLOP sold all the information on every person to the dark web, so, so did Cigna and a few others. I don't know that this is accurate. I don't know if that's the truth, but I did research it and I did find the article. CLOP, C-L-O-P, real easy to find. Um, Anyway, that's just interesting in the news. And some people, it's not just Aetna, by the way, that was affected by that. Some other insurance companies were too that use this data transmission thing. If you're considering who to work with in the industry, I'm telling you, in experience matters. In just a second, you're going to see a very revealing video, if you follow my advice and watch Mary Ann's video, exposing what's behind Medicare Advantage and the profit behind it. I won't go to that link because there are some of my people that are acquaintances in the industry that are in that but she doesn't mind exposing them. So I'll show you what her video is. Um, MJLH said, my local hospital and clinic stopped taking Medicare Advantage, this is just today, and are advising patients to stick with regular Medicare. I wrote back to her comment and said, where is this happening in your case? She just wrote back, I'm in Eastern Oregon. So that's where that's happening. It's happening across the country, really. So if we can help you, you can call the 800 number, but the best way to reach us is go to the website and follow the path and the education and the ability to get on our calendar automatically. And we will continue to work with that process to make that simpler to get on the calendar. But a friend of mine that's also on YouTube shared with me two years ago, or was it three now, Matthew, about using Calendly and how you can get somebody right on your calendar without having to have them call you and you call them and they call you and you call them and just go right on the calendar and we're there. We keep our appointments. We bend over backwards to keep our appointments. Our agents are exhausted. Please be nice to them and please keep your appointment if you make one. We hold true to what we say we're going to do. I would hope you do the same thing. And here is Marianne's video. Please watch this. It is absolutely earth shattering and important that you have this information. God bless you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Go watch it. Click the link there.